Okay, now we're going to look at part two, and uh, I've already shown you connections of the ancient people up in Bulgaria, in Magura Caves, and it, it described a few others there, and then of course that's connections with Cattle Hoyuk, and you can see the symbology of the uh, ostriches and so on that are going on there. And uh, what we're going to watch here is David Roll. Um, I remember when he was younger, had a fuller head of hair, had darker hair, and uh, much more uh, good young man looks to himself uh, 25 years ago, people, somewhere around in there. And uh, the word came out somehow that uh, he was a left fieldy kind of guy and that he had gotten cocky and that you shouldn't believe in him and stuff. But uh, believe it or not, if you keep putting in stuff in YouTube trying to find little things that I do whenever I'm looking around in these exact same type of wordings and everything, uh, things pop up on the side and every once in a while you'll look at him and I saw his name and I was like oh my god he's an old man now and so I clicked on this video here he is giving a presentation right before Robert Bavall leads a presentation and so let's look at this and he'll show you these things and I believe we are going to go to at least a third part on this but it's important to show these connections now this is a pyramid free zone for one hour okay no pyramids no cartouches, no huge stone blocks, okay? This is a very different sort of lecture. Whatever Dominic said to introduce me, it's about the origins of Egyptian civilization. So here we go, Egyptian Genesis. So that's what we're looking at here is pre-dynastic Egyptians and so on. And a lot of this rock art, and again, what we're showing here is these boats that they show and they've got the palm fronds sticking out of one end of them and they've got that ballerina lady and the high proud boats and each one of these dashes that are in here is significant of a person there's the hut that's in the center of it right here ching 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 hut and then a lot of times there's other scratches down here and that would indicate oars although they also have things where it shows you where they stick the oars through these one parts and stuff off of them and they keep things like arrows and maces attached up into here for some reason. But uh, let's look into this. It's all about the how it all began. Where did Egyptian civilization come from? And that Horus symbol there and the onks that are there, I've showed you a symbology that works with that. So let's just, I don't know, let, let's let him talk. But you can also see how that bird lady effigy I was showing you turned into this Isis and this winged sun disk concept too. This greater winged sun disk concept. Is it indigenous to the Nile Valley or is it from outside? That's what we're going to address today. And the answer is yes. When I wrote a book on this subject back in the 1990s, this is a, a brief introduction of what the whole process of discovery was. The origins of pharaonic civilization have always been shrouded in mystery. What caused dynastic cultures to birth forth in the Nile Valley within such a relatively short period of time? It has long been recognized that the emergence of pharaonic rule, this is the pharaoh's name, not the indigenous people, coincided with an entirely unprecedented series of phenomena which formed the recognizable foundation of what we identify as pharaonic Egypt. And the same can be said about Sumeria, but even a slightly earlier date than this, that their dynastic culture seemed to burst forth out of nowhere, out of its primordial valley that's mentioned in the Bible. That's the Tigris and Euphrates and where it comes from, and that land's called Eden. And where things had supposedly come from, even telling in the Bible, that's where it started at, and then it spread out, and then they all talk about Egypt all of a sudden and go over there, right? and lead up to Anatolia and Jerusalem and all the area there and then at the end of the Bible it goes up into Rome and so on but let's continue with this okay so we're dealing with the elites we're not dealing with the ordinary people we're dealing with the people in charge of the country well I'm telling you two cultures got together but they were the same primordial people you got the Horn of Africa Caucasians that we've seen since primordial times and archaeology shows such being in the area 
of what we would call Ethiopia all the way down through the top of the Nile, they're coming in. And then the people that lived primordially around the entire Mediterranean with nothing stopping them. The Nile Delta was just little hopping points around through. In fact, people found that an incredibly nice place to live uh, as long as it didn't super flood over. This is another problem. And of course, floods are attached to all of these ancient groups, but that's for another reason and the same reason. But let's continue here. Again, the lotus tops that are on these pillars here that you see, right? And just about all the temples, but some of the other ones have other things, like poppies. Now, these, these innovations that occur at the particular period I'm going to show you include decorated lug-handled pottery. I'll show you what a lug-handled pot looks like in a minute. We looked at them earlier, but... Stone vessels appear for the first time. Fancy stone vessels. Zoomorphic vessels. A zoomorphic vessel is something that is represented in the shape of an animal. Right. Okay, so a stone vessel carved in the shape of an animal. Anthropomorphic creatures. A carved slate palette, like the one you see here. This right. is a typical pre slate palette that you see there. This is not going to work on this screen, I don't think, because it's a screen that doesn't work with a laser. So I'm going to have to... Now this is known as a coal or a makeup palette that they would crush up the the eye makeup that they would put on that they had to put on mascara kind of like a ball player does and it helped them in the sun that was there and uh, so on and of course in the art it's always shown as being extremely beautiful but it's really thought that they maybe just pretty much smeared it under their eyes and did things like that in fancy times they would do crush emeralds or lapis lazuli and put it above their eyes with honey sticking it to their eyes and things like that but if you look at this creature here, people have tried to say that's a dinosaur, and it's really just a panther with a long, long neck. And that's Sumerian also. In fact, this idea of a stele is Sumerian in its first original idea. And uh, we talk about decorated lug handle pottery and stone vessels, and then there's some badass lug handle pottery stone vessels, zoomorphic, carved plates, so on. So let's continue. Pear-shaped mace heads. I'll deal with that a little bit later. You'll understand that better a little bit later on. Makes a difference. Military standards. So we see for the first time where the, the followers of Horus are carrying the standards insignia of their different clans. It's like the Shimsu Hora and they're holding different clans like you said so different groups are together tribal come to, had come together and this is their banners if you will like you see in all the ancient you know, medieval stuff and the, carrying the banner and the banner of the Templars, the banners and stuff and leading into the idea of flags that we all have today. But let's continue. High proud boats. This is very important for Dominic. This is a key factor that we see featured in this period. It's key for Mud all of us. Mud architecture. Mud bricks. The niched facade palace facade. I'll explain that a little bit later too. Niche, niche facade palace. It's where it notches in and out and in and out. Almost like a lego -y kind of concept type thing. You can see that. And then there's early writing that he's fixing to mention there. Now, let's make a few more connections here real quick. The ancient Sumerian gods were called Dengir and the gods that ruled over Egypt were called Engir. So that's extremely similar. They have cuneiform writing, which is the same, and based on the same phonetic concepts. That should hit hard. Back, 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 that's a home run. The ideogram concepts that they have are extremely similar. And these proud boats that they have, the mud brick architecture that they start off with and the bricks are exactly the same size and he's going to validate that symbol for you too. Let's let him go and let's look at this. Early writing occurs at this time, right at the beginning, probably about 400 years before the first dynasty. And then kingship. Before this time we have no kings in Egypt. The kings start in this era. So, let's look at the timeline for a moment. The Nakata one period, we call it, is from around 4,400 BC. This is the time that Robert writes about in his book, The Black Genesis, so he... Of course, Robert tries to say that it was started off with Negroids and that it went from there and that there was always some contingent. It doesn't show in genetics. It doesn't show in 
any other form of it. The Nubians showed up right around after the first few dynasties, and then they weren't around for another 500 years. They showed up as Nubia A and then Nubia C. I've proved that in a lot of my other videos here, but what he's going to fix and to do here, because he, he's, he's making fun of Robert, because Robert's not an actual Egyptologist. Roger, Robert wasn't doing that at all in any way, shape, or form, but he figured out the by getting into it on the side, he figured out that, uh, hey, that matches Orion too. And the next thing you know, he started going around to these uh, lectures and learning off other people and learning himself and going into it deep and came up with his own type concepts and definitely got with Robert Schock and a few of the others on their ideas. So people are all trying to pull all this together and show you how much difference there is from what you're shown and taught than what you're really given in the first place. But he is dealing with the Nilotic peoples coming from Sub-Saharan Africa into the Nile Valley, developing certain cultural traits, astronomy, the worship of the cow, domestication of animals, that sort of thing. Happens in this period. Happens in Akata 1, but these cows are found to be Sumerian. The grain that comes from there is found to be Sumerian. In fact, that Sumerian emmer grains that they have are what we still use today in hybrid forms of it. And from what the natural grain was to what the emmer grains are that we used then and today, uh, there's a large amount of change. Like we know corn didn't used to be quite as plentiful as it is. And of course, Monsanto changes things and all that. Well, they've changed it less than 1.3% of its genetic code, although it's like 16% of its genetic code changed from primordial corn that they can still find today. To corn that we have today they're like that's so different it's like a wolf and a dog it's a domestication of grains and so on that's going on and this is a horn of africa situation that came on from a first original people that had come here from what you would call pretty much sumeria and the lower area of there and the elamites and the people that were there but let's continue with it he tells you that they disappear real quick it's here and uh, then we have nakada too which is a different culture. And in between here, around 3,500 BC, we got our first contact with Mesopotamia. At this. So he's showing you the Mesopotamian contact here, and I'm telling you that a somewhat Mesopotamian contact had come before, but the people that were endemic coming up the Nile Valley itself and what we call Egypt today up to the Horn, not the Nakata Horn people that were also endemic at this point, but the people coming up the Nile there were people that I showed you that are related to the Europeans and so on. It's kind of how they show you in King Tut's genetics how a lot of the Europeans have the same type of haplogroup. And it can't be from King Tut because he had a couple of children that died and so on and he was too young anyhow. So where do they get it from? Well, it's not from him. It's from his parents and his parents' parents and what haplogroups those have shown up and say, well, those are related to these people. And so is the Tsar Nicholas of Russia and a few other important people that they've noted are this same haplogroup that concentrates over in Western Europe. Time. Okay, so indigenous valley peoples, here something new comes in and we have this contact arriving between the two. And then there's an account of three period, which is an advanced culture this is where we start to see the kings appearing for the first time here. And again, we have a secondary contact with Mesopotamia between the Carter II and the Carter I. So we're dealing with both of those periods. Yep, and it seems to herald it. If we look at where that is in Egyptian history, Dynasty Zero is the Carter III, so around the time of King Scorpion. And then we go through to the first dynasty and the second dynasty, the Carter III and then onwards into the Pharaonic period. So the time before that is what we call the pre-dynastic. So the whole era before Dynasty One, including the Carter One and the Carter Two, is the pre-dynastic period. And there's a time before that too that they speak of, and it's called Zeptepi, and how they had come across a large body of water and big things had happened. And I'm telling you, that leads from the primordial flood in the first place. Then there was a secondary one that I described in another video here recently and that this heralded in the idea uh, that God said there wouldn't be a flood again and that there was. It decimated Mesopotamia and many of the people left. It left it bereft pretty much of what it was and then Elamites came in. It, it, it describes this exactly into a T inside of the uh, lament of Ur 
in the tablets of Sumerian Akkadians, which carried on the tradition of that and carried it on to where we can still find it today, luckily. But it uh, also, some 5200 BC, so it predates this, where they had it going on. And this Mesopotamian contact here seems to coincide with that first set, that second common, with that second set, and then here coming up, which I talked about in the video, we do have a third set that happens at a later point. And set is important too, and Seti and Seth, and the Seth of the Bible, you know, because Cain and Abel and so on, but then hold on, didn't they have another kid? Yeah, they did. Okay, but do they go into lineages on uh -huh. They don't go into everybody's lineages so much, but if you figure it all out, it really only comes out to be in about 4,000 BC, and here we're looking at how we stretch past that. So how is God going to step in and do this creation of the world when all this is already going on? Let's just continue. I should have said to you, are there any other Egyptologists in the room? Professionals. Professional Egyptologists. He likes to poke people. You recognize an Egyptologist because he always wears a tie, okay? Am I the only one in the room with a tie on? Yes. What are you going to say? Okay, stay away. Believe it or not, he's actually getting in Robert Baval's face there, and he says, any Egyptologist, and he kind of raised his hand and looked around, and he goes, real Egyptologist. Made him put his hand down. He's like, getting, he's getting cocky. So I'm guessing this is what the people talked about, how he had gotten, once he started figuring some stuff out other people didn't know, he's his presentation style. It's, it's a bit European and a bit uh, eccentric, and of course he even talks about his suit and so on, but... Uh, you know, whenever you're digging, Indiana Jones wore a suit in the, in the office there, but when he was out, that's when he had a different hat on and a wholly different situation. And I definitely remember pictures of this guy where he was trying to Indiana Jones out back in the day, too. And this is at the point where people said he got cocky. I'm guessing getting cocky finally got him somewhere, though. Let's continue. So, the, the, one of the things that Robert's dealt with a lot is this idea of the Hermetica, the idea of the traditional stories about the bringing of knowledge by Thoth the God Thoth to Egypt. It's in fact known as Tautus the Phoenician. And so you get this idea of Phoenicians. And uh, I'll tell you something, a secret out of that too, and where they originally came from was the same place too. It, Herodotus tells you the same thing, that they had come around from out of the Euphrates Strait all the way around and up into the Red Sea and through and in and then hopped over somehow. That they didn't go all the way around Africa whenever they did it. I don't know how everybody knew all this, but there's a couple of people that relate to it. And then others, of course, are just relating to what they were told about what was said before. But the Caddaceus and the symbol of a curled snake and so on. And if you'll look, there's two crowns of Egypt and they're separated, but he's together showing them the knowledge that goes along with it. Thoth is shown as being something slightly different, and there's a few of these, Horus, there's a few of these that are definitely shown as something different, and we've already gotten into a portion of that, but let's continue. And that is really something involving what we call Septethi, the first time, or the primeval age of Egyptian history, Right. where the gods are born, where the gods rule, and then we evolve into the dynastic period. Now you hear the ancient stories of Punt and where that supposedly is, and it's got to be up some 25 days journey, if you read the stories in there, up the Red Sea and then out somewhere, and it had to be some people that were primordial to themselves up in the Horn of Africa during that time. Not the people that are there today in any way, shape, or form. The Ethiopians that are there now today are not what they called Ethiopia either. If you look at the Greek uh, translation just wiki it it'll show you all these areas that they describe people as being Ethiopian which really once you figure into depth just mean people with tan or swarthy skin anybody darker than a pale Greek would be called that but uh, now we're gonna look at the Edfu temple and its shape is very mustabish it's something else that I want to bring into this right now at this point is that the first Egyptian temples and things were mustabas right the first the death places were mastabas people ended up taking that mastaba idea and taking it on to a further point this edfu temple if you were to go straight up with it like the old mastabas are it would end up being like the uh, capitol building or whatever that's over in san francisco the giant pyramid that's there and but that's extremely pointed pyramid it's not the correct one 
but if you took this Mastaba situation and went up with it, of course they declinated it in. There's different reasons for that and geometry and things too, but we're not going to go into the depth on that. That's esoteric. And I'm going to start this talk by introducing to you to something you're probably not familiar with. You all, I'm sure, recognize Edfu Temple, a Ptolemaic or Greco-Roman temple. But in this temple is a record of prehistoric times, the, the Septepi, the first time. And it's about a mysterious group of gods called the Sheptiu. You've probably never even heard of the Sheptiu. It's not really published in most literature. Egyptologists don't really talk about it either. Most of them don't even know about it. And the reason is because the record of the Shebtu is recorded high up on the outside of the Proneos, so we're outside the temple here, and this wall, the highest part of the Proneos, has a record of the story of the foundation of Egyptian civilization by the Shebtu. And what does Shebtu mean? Well, we'll deal with that now. The scene when you get close to it is that the king is worshipping the falcon god Horus who is standing on the reeds a bunch of reeds, and on this sacred primeval island there are eight gods sitting on their thrones, and these are the Sheptiu. Okay. It's really seven plus one, it's the sacred seven plus one. Okay. Now this is in Greco-Roman times, so it's looking back a long, long way back. But yeah. these names are not the names of the gods that you're familiar with. If we look at the first three, the first one is called Wa. Now, Wa means the distant one, and the name Horus also means the distant one. This is also the... From far away, from distant one, and something along that line. And Horus, yeah, distant one. It's, it's part of his epitaphs, even. Same epithet that's used for the Mesopotamian flood hero. Uh -huh. The three different flood heroes have the same terminology, the distant one. Yeah. The next god is Aa, and that word means the Great One. So we're, we're guessing now who these people are. These two gods are in the, in the pantheon you're familiar with. And there's Hor Aha that starts right at the very first of it. So it starts to tell you some of these are connections of telling you whose children, whose were. And then it just disintegrates with people and nicknames and names that are not their names, but names that are given to them due to deeds or how they followed or what they did. You can tell it when they grew up that guy's name was Jim, but later they ended up calling him Dejet De Chor Aha. You know, and what does that mean? That means that that's his king epitaph and things, and that's how we lose a lot of this too, and it can't be kept up with exactly. And the most interesting one of all is the third one, because his name is Nai, and Nai means the sailor. So Dominic, the third most important god in prehistory is a sailor or a navigator. A sailor or a navigator. Got to mention that because you think of Egypt and these people puddled up and down the Nile and that's all that they did, right? Well, that's pretty much is what they did. But no, there's the story of the ancient shipwreck sailor from way back when. There's all these stories of them going in far distant lands. But the Phoenicians, those were the ones that were, had it going on big time. And before that, it was the Sumerians. Even in their stories, they show you a lot. I'll show you something here in a moment, but I'll probably wait for a better moment for it. Now, they have epithets or characteristics. They're called the August Sheptiu, and Sheptiu translates vaguely as the senior ones, okay? They're called the children of Tarchenen, and Chenen, the Tarchenen is the risen land, the primeval mound which rises out of the abyss at creation. If you know your story of Genesis, the world begins with an abyss, okay, and the land comes out of the abyss. It's the same thing, and it's the same thing in Sumerian, and it's very similar to their idea there's a primordial abyss but a lot of people had an idea there's even stories of turtle backs coming up out of the water that that's how they see it as that it was all covered with water and it was all water and then this happened and so on it's the original and so these are offsprings of the creator people too the adamic people they're called the offspring of the creator and the creator god in egyptian theology is atom adam 
They're called the Glorious Spirits of the Early Primeval Age, or Septepi. And they are also referred to as the Builder Gods, because they, they are the gods who build the primeval temple on the primeval mound. They are the designers, the architects of the first temple. In ancient sites are known as tepes and tells. These are little hills, little bumps, where people living there so long have built up and up and up onto them. And in ancient Sumeria, you see this effect where they are built up, and then in the prime position, they built these giant ziggurats, which don't look exactly like the modern pyramids, but they do look like step pyramids, like Djoser, and they do look a lot like the mastabas and things they had before then. And all of their burial pits are mastabas, and some of those have Roman arches in them. And a lot of things you don't give credit for people having way back at that time. Now we know that there's a lot of things that come out of Sumerian and all this knowledge, but yet my children at school right now are not taught the ancient Sumerians. They literally give them a half a page and tell them, yeah, they'd come up with some writing in early math and man, check out these Egyptians and they're the ones of the Bible and, oh, and they go on with that kind of idea with it and it's like, really? You're not going to... When's the when, when's the first grade they're going to start mentioning Gobekli Tepe and they're going to start mentioning things like that or is that going to have to be in a college course? And if you don't go, you don't know. Is that how that's going to work? They're called the Brethren of the Sages. And when we count the sages, seven. there are seven in all, all together. The Apkalu Sages. In this temple, it, the Apkalu Sages are seven in number that herald the Anunnaki gods of the Sumerians. So it's really eight. It's Thoth and the seven sages called the leader of the seven. So here we have a situation where we have eight Sheptu gods and we have seven sages and one leader. That also adds up to eight. Now, have you, have you ever asked yourself why it is that um, the pharaohs living in this hot climate have these huge, massive beards? Isn't that weird? Egyptians don't naturally grow big, thick beards, and yet always the pharaohs are shown with these false beards attached to their chins. Why is that? Why is that? Well, who used to have them? Show beards. Whose kings and nobility had show beards? Sumerians. And stepped beards, too. Although they have a wrinkled and rippled beard, but the gods had a different form. It's shown also in Egyptians where they do the same dual concept. That. Where does that come from? It comes from Sumeria. They also have these boats, these funerary boats, which in this case is buried next to the Khufu pyramid. I swore I would not say pyramid, but I just have. It could be a drinking game, but he's going to be good about it and really not mention it too much. Here we see looped oars. <clears throat> this is the king's processional boat and how it's been keeled in the back part of it. You see how the back part of it is kicked forward? You see up front how it bends up. There's no reason to build it looking this way unless it's symbolic. You might as well chop it off right here. Why would you have a stanza on the top of it? And quite a few, I tell you, used to have bird effigies on the front of it, which would make it look very much like a dragon open mouth dragon even forms things like that creatures they put on the front of it it's leading their way Rah! and of course right here on the front of their prowls quite often they would put women which is a whole different story altogether and everything there's a cage that's on this thing that would have held something to have been taken and helped back and forth and then this whole covered stanza area here and the king's chamber that's on this and this thing is huge it is huge but this all comes from this reed idea. In fact, now's a good time to show you this one extra thing, and then we'll probably clip this one here. Um, let's see, we're hitting 29, so I'm not gonna make it uh, to the other part unless we do it right now, or we wait 10 minutes. Well, we wait 10 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and show you this. Well, first, I can show you that it's hard to find something on Shimsu Horror or Shamsi you find Shamsi, now Shams is Shamash, that's the sun god, so you find it again on that. Horus is related to that, as the sun disk, all these things are the sun disk. That sun disk is carried on through Mithraism too, by the way, but dating creation, 
which I just did a video on to, it tells you that the rains before the Shimsu horror were 23,200 years, but then after they had 13,420 years that were connected to them. Again, I, I tell you that there's a lunar calendar problem situation and all these things, but the cattle count that they used to run in Egypt, right? Ancient Egypt and cattle count, which they supposedly did every other year, and it's how they date everything that goes on to it. wasn't necessarily done every other year, but they found it in a time period where it was, and now they say, oh, so they did that through all of them, so here's how you date everything. And it doesn't follow that. But then again, the Shimsu Hork is consisted of a journey by the king of his, in his court, a symbolic journey that they would do, and they would carry this boat around and drag it along the ground on these sleds, like they carried all the rocks on sleds, because, well, uh, you know, the up areas over there in Sumeria, they had wheels and stuff, but it ain't going to work through the sandy area and stuff and thin wheels, and it just doesn't work, but sleds gets pulled along almost like snow. You know, you can actually sled down sand dunes. I mean, I should put a video right now where they show people surfing and, and skiing down sand dunes, for God's sakes. But, um, yeah, pretty neat. But also in the Turin's Kings list, way back here, when they have Hepe, like Happy, right? The God of the Waters. Shimsu. Shimsu is way back here. Before Menes. Mini. Right? And then Worka and so on. You go through these ancient names that's back there where they want, want you to steer away from it. But, uh, and, and, and they just act like, oh, it just gets confusing, so we're just going to leave it alone type situation. Would you look at these high, proud boats that they used to make? And you could hook two of them up together. And this is actually a floating city recreating what's known of that they had there. Look at this fake ship boat thing that they've built. And this giant, two of them put together like a catamaran that they're running on off the flooded areas that are there. And these proud boats that are bent and bent up in the front. I think you can see that pretty good there. That's off the edge. I'm sorry. But how these people make this stuff just out of reeds. You know, in these reed huts that are there that are quite incredible. And like I say, some of these things have effigies on them. Why is this not even showing squared? That's odd. But uh, you can see, hopefully, at the corner here. This one here has, yeah, you can barely see it, but it has that dragon head effigy that's on it. And, uh... Hmm, these are offset, but the buildings these people used to make out of these same reeds and the things look like a like a resort and you think these are something modern that they come up with and they have tablets that go way back, way, way back uh, in the first of tablets that they have when they have ideograms and they have this symbol that are on things so they were building these giant huts and you can see these reed pontoons that are here that are just not bent. The ones over the top are bent though. Um, another picture of one there that's more of a depiction that looks like what's on one of the tablets, believe it or not. I've got a whole video that's on this. This is uh, on the insides of one. You can see how huge they are and how you can hook them up together and in between each one you can make a doorway and connect them with H's and T's and so on and they can end up being quite huge. Look at these. They look like resorts. To the point people can hook up ceiling fans and stuff into them and really kick back in these things. Yep. It's amazing. And they make boats that look like this. And this is a recreation of what the replica of the Deluge Ark was from the Sumerian myth idea. Where its cubits design seems to have been something a little bit more rounded off and squared rather than long and rectangled. But that would have been a lot like the boats that they do use that are in there. And there's one of the guys that helped to recreate it. That's uh, Irving Finkel. And he's from uh, here in America. So these high proud boats. These pointy high proud boats that you see like this. And uh, that's in the first of the video. That's what opens up the video is these things. And where does this all start from? And where does it come from? Well, these ancient Sumerians had these ancient reed boats and they go back longer than people want to let them allowed to be. And I tell you, there are ancient Sumerian reboats that are shown like this. He's about to show some of them. And they show a stanza set, and there's a sail. And the sails originally were run across the, uh, the ropes coming down, and they would catch the wind blowing this triangulation way, that triangulation way, and use them in that method. 
and it slowly turned into boats that looked a lot more like this. But in primordial times, you can still see this high proud situation, which is all around the world, high, high proud little pointy tipped boats, that there's no real reason for that to be going on. And then you find others that are scuttle and catamaran situations that come around and they seem to be island hoppers, if you will, right? Anyhow, so these giant Sumerian reed boats, and you can see with them building one of these houses right here and how it looks, and how they skeleton out of these little tubes. And of course, if you can build that, you can build a house and you can cover it with bitumen too. And if you flip that thing upside down, now you got an ark. And how did they seal all the ceilings and stuff? Was there a time whenever people were close to bitumen and they were able to use that? And I showed this also in my uh, in my uh, Thor Heyerdahl videos where it showed Thor Heyerdahl making it all the way to America in, in uh, two attempts on these. One went to Easter Island, one came to the Americas here. And uh, so something that could have happened in much primordial times and also in the Americas they have these same reed boats up there in the areas that are in concern. And uh, illustrations too of some of the oldest of these boats that they had going on from way back and the fish that are in here in the water and you can tell they're going through that but then there's other depictions that the Sumerians have that are coming into Egypt that really have a depiction that looks like they're bringing them over land and on sleds so uh, yeah I'm gonna stop this one here and then we're gonna go with part three guys and I don't know if I'll get it all finished in three. I just want to keep enveloping and showing you as much as I can to make sure we get this concept complete in this one video, if I can try to do it, or one series of videos. So up in your top left-hand corner there, we're going to part three. Uh, if you need to go back to part one, it's going to show up in your top right-hand right there. And before you leave, like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you hit that bell, too, because some of the people aren't getting their notifications, and you won't know when they come out. But... I'll see you in part three. Click in that top left. Peace.